Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 102nd New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Brooke Cameron Rappaport, Lauren Haynes, and Ken Lum with Helen Lee and Joaquin Pissarro. We're also thrilled to have the poet Kimberly Alidio here and who will read to close today's program. We'd also like to thank Dermot Company for sponsoring this week of the New Social Environment. You can learn more about them and the Rails Curatorial Project with them from 2016 through the links that will be in the chat in just a second. And now to turn to our conversation for the day, I will introduce very quickly my two Rail comrades, Helen Lee, a Rail board member, and Joaquin Pissarro, Rail consulting editor. And without further ado, I hand the conversation over to you, Helen and Joaquin. Thank you, Nick. Hello, Helen. How hey, are you? Joaquin. How are you doing? Very well, very well. Thank you. And yourself? I'm doing as well as can be expected, but I'm very excited about today's conversation. Um, it's so am I. Topic. Um, statues have been taken down and reconsidered throughout the U.S. in the past couple of months amid the ongoing anti-racist program protests. But meanwhile, there's a parallel conversation about what should be put in their place. Um, it's a topic I think we've all have heard about and may have actually had conversations before this because uh, monuments are part of our everyday lives. Um, so it's wonderful that we have these three very expert and knowledgeable um, guests on our conversation today. And so without further ado, let's introduce them so we can get the conversation started. Um, Brooke Kamen Rappaport is the Deputy Director and Martin Friedman Chief Curator at Madison Square Park Conservancy. She was also the Commissioner and Curator of the U.S. Pavilion at the 2019 Venice Biennale, which featured the work of Martin Purrier. Um, it was entitled Liberty Liberta. Joaquin, do you want to introduce Ken and Lauren? Yes. Ken, uh, Ken Lam is uh, an artist that many of you I know are familiar, conceptual and representational artist. He's also the chair of fine arts at Penn at the University of Pennsylvania's uh, School of uh, Design in, in Philly. And uh, particularly relevant today, he founded, together with Paul Farber, uh, the Monument Lab, which is a platform that initiates and encourages discussions that are very much of the moment and very topical to today's conversation. Lauren, Lauren Haynes uh, is the uh, Director of Artists Initiatives and Curator of Contemporary Art at Crystal Bridges in Bentonville, Bentonville Arkansas, a museum I warmly encourage you to, to visit. And I had the great privilege, the joy of working with Lauren for more for two or three years, right? I mean, this has been a, a, an ongoing project. Uh, this, I mean, innovating in a sense, because I don't think this kind of exhibitions ever happened before. We, we looked at the meaning, the, the role of crystal throughout the entire history of art. Uh, just a note on uh, some of you may not have gone to uh, Arkansas, to Bentonville, to this incredible museum. Um, I have, uh, it has to be said, seldom, if uh, ever, experienced a greater more meaningful experience of diversity among the members of, of the public than I did at um, Crystal Bridges on my several occasions, my several visits there. Uh, I know this is something that the founder of the museum, Alice Walton, is very committed to. So is her entire curatorial staff. And my hat to you guys, because you have uh, achieved something re remarkable and we should take example from. So as you said, Helen, uh, um, without further ado, perhaps we should begin the conversation. And, uh, and, and and precisely the question that Helen uh, Get them on. Uh, come on, we need you on. Lauren, Ken, Brooke, are you all on? We're here. Okay, Hi. great. Um, Hi, so I think jumping into the conversation is the way to go here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things we wanted to start out by doing is just asking you, how do you define monuments? What are the symbolic or maybe traditional um, representational issues that go with this idea of monument? Ken, Lauren, do you want to start? 
Uh, well, to me, a mo monument um, is uh, a memory aid, something that memorializes um, and to, is dependent on the idea that there is some consensus in terms of why it uh, should be memorialized. It has to have some sense of scale as well. And, um, uh, but it, it, it also is not unproblematic in the sense that that consensus is highly contested as well, but we, are, we, we, bespoke, we bestow a kind of universal consensus and agreement that it is important, but monuments are also uh, a, a reflection of, um, of the hierarchy of power that's in place in society. Yeah, I think I would maybe add to that also just the idea that they feel of a very, it's a very, almost like a snapshot of a moment as particular time, right? Like when all of that information and everything is being taken into consideration, um, it can shift. And the idea of what is being depicted, how it's represented, what people think of it is always shifting, even probably um, dependent on who you ask when it's being created. I, I, I think, think, I think that's right. And, uh, and I would also add that monuments are about historic myth-making. And what they bring and what they reflect is not only the person, the individual who's on the pedestal, but looking behind the scenes. Who commissioned that monument? What's the location of that monument? Um, whose history is commemorated in that monument? And those are things that are all um, in question right now um, and, and contested right now. Um, and that follows to the fact that history isn't fixed. We think of monuments because they can be in stone, marble, or bronze as permanent, but in fact, they're not. Um, and that's what we're learning um, even more today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is very well put. Thank you, uh, all three of you. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, Rook, you, you, and, and uh, Lauren, you both put uh, an accent on a, a contradiction in a way, or a very strong paradox inherent in, in the notion of monument, which is that, yes, it aspires to create a certain permanence. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly about the, the role of consensus here. Can I, we can go back to this, because it, in effect, it's who is deciding upon those, make, making those monuments? When is it ever uh, the case when a monument is chosen by a public referendum, by a public no, voice. I, I, I think you misunderstand me. I'm saying that we, it, it's premised on this, this bestowing assumption of consensus. Ah, right, right. Okay. that the consensus is actually there. Yes, okay, okay, thank you. I, then I, I understand. Thanks, thanks for this uh, uh, qualification. But both uh, Brooke and, and Lauren put the accent on the contradiction inherent in monuments insofar as it is aspiring to some, as you said, can universality, but it is in fact inherently relative. And I love the fact that Lauren point, points, points out to the snapshot effect. It is in effect the creation of an instant that would like to aspire to eternity. And that by definition is impossible. Maybe this is a good time to look at our first image. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to give it away, but I think it, 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 uh, it illustrates some of the points that we're all making. And um, hmm. so, Brooke, do you want to discuss this image and how it's sort of illustrated of this illustrative of this idea of a shift or? Right. Uh, um, this is a work by Sonia Clark, um, who is a, um, uh, an American artist. And this is Sonia. Um, and the project is called Unraveling. It's ongoing. It's an edition of 10. She began the piece in uh, 2015, which was the 150th anniversary of the ending of the American Civil War. Um, what Sonia does is she displays the Confederate flag, which is this aberrant um, symbol of the Confederate States of America that was maintained and then revived into the 20th and, and 21st centuries. And she purposefully pulls apart the very fiber um, of that flag and the symbolism of that flag. This is a remarkably human scale work. It's, it's performative. Um, people get together and they 
pull very carefully and slowly the threads that bound um, that bound people and communities in the southern United States. So just, um, I think this work is so powerful in that it is a very strong image, but through the actions of this uh, Sonia Clark and others who I think are unraveling it, it changes its meaning. Um, and I think that brings us to a conversation about what's happening now. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest on who these statues are representing, but also as Brooke, you mentioned, the context and the location and Lauren and Ken, both this idea that these works are made and created with a sort, certain historical uh, context. Um, maybe we can, you can uh, talk a little bit about why some of these protests are happening and what is going on with these issues about memorialization and memory um, and, and the conversation around those issues. I think we have images too um, to follow up on some of these ideas. May I, I maybe Helen, and, and I would like, of course, to, to hear both, uh, all three voices among our guests, but when we're talking about monumental, mon monuments, monumental, monumentalization, what is happening here, and the, the, the extraordinary moving uh, performance by Sonia Clark is absolutely spot on, really to the, goes to the core of this, is the demonumentalization, the unmodern, turning those monuments almost upside down, taking them out of the public memory, and how do we do this? How we, do we go about this? Why are we doing this only now? Uh, when really, as uh, you see a piece of Sonia, Sonia by Sonia, uh, that is celebra celebrating memory, or bringing to memory again, the fact that we're already a hundred plus, a few decades away from the civil war, where the civil war is with us right now. You know, if you look at other countries with post-communist, post-Nazi, there's always been a case a particular short period, take Germany in 1945, when we go through the denazification, taking the monuments to Hitler, Himmler, and his gang away from the public eye. We never did this in America. Why? Well, I, I think there's um, immense uh, symbolic capital uh, imbued in the uh, Confederate flag, like, like all uh, you know, bronze or marble Confederate um, statuary as well. And, um, and it's that even if it's a highly constructed one, it, it represents symbolically uh, um, uh, uh, deep wells of um, meaning, even if it's, if it's falsely constructed. And, uh, and that's where the, the hard work of trying to uh, address uh, racism and, and um, inequity and, and, and social injustice in, in, in society begins with the dismantling of the, of the uh, social uh, of the symbolic capital that's that's in place. Mm -hmm. But what I think is interesting about the Sonia Clark work is that it's not simply about uh, the burning the flag, uh, eradicating it. It's actually uh, being broken down into its filaments, into its threads, and uh, and and salvaged in a way, and uh, allows for a reimagining of these threads into a into a into a new symbol, into a new purpose. I also like about this particular work how careful and um, slowly it's unraveling. It's not an incendiary, huge act. It's very mindful and careful. Um, yeah. Lauren, I know that we, uh, that we had your mic muted for a second. Um, do you want to weigh in on, on this image or some of the ideas that Ken and Joachim have talked about? Yeah, well, it was more also thinking about this idea, sort of a question that Joaquin posed as to like, you know, why this moment and why now? You know, I think for many people, the dismantling, the taking down of these symbols of these monuments has been very active work. Um, I think we are in a moment now where it is happening on a larger scale. There's maybe more attention being paid by certain people and more things happening, but I also think we're at a point where some of the frustration is now taking, people are doing it themselves, right? Going, taking monuments down, putting their own interventions on monuments and really, you know, saying, well, we, we tried it your way. We tried to go these other routes and now this is what we're doing because we can't wait 
we're no longer going to sort of be patient about this process that has been ongoing for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A really good point. And, and what you look at, for example, this, this work, um, Robert E. Lee in Dallas, this was made um, in the immediate, this is made between the De American Depression um, and and America's entry into World War II. Um, it was removed in September 2017 and then sold to a private bidder at an auction um, in 2019. But as much as we have to look at, again, what we spoke of in the beginning of the object and who is on that pedestal, look at the period in which it was made. Um, yeah. So why in this period, are people reaffirming value systems from the Confederate era? Um, I mean, all of, anyway, each monument has a story um, behind it like that. Um, and that's concerning and, and absolutely disconcerting. And I think that now we're starting to, like Sonia did, unravel um, these histories and artists are proposing new histories, and we'll get to those. Um, we'll get to those slides later. Yeah, I, I think that's such an important point you're making, book here, which is uh, you, you pointed out uh, earlier on about the uh, uh, shifting ideologies, the, and what you're pointing out here is the multi-layered histories of these uh, these so-called monuments. What's interesting is that they are not a fixed uh, uh, image, a substantial image. They have themselves a accreted meaning. Uh, these things didn't exist right after the Civil War. This is not a just a celebration of the Confederacy. It is in fact, a re as you pointed out, a return in the 1930s, one of the most uh, important decade in the formation of modern democracy in the United States, that it is at that particular point that this thing returns. So that's particularly disturbing, I find. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Go ahead, Matt Ken. I was just going to say uh, it's worth looking at the iconography. It's, it really it looks like a sculptural form of a Masonier painting, and he's kind of very. Uh, I wouldn't say it's 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 obviously highly competent, but it's not. It's like in the uh, socialist realist vein of iconography, which is which or like something you might find on the side of the Arc de Triomphe, like the bas relief, that mm -hmm. kind of very militaristic, Napoleonic, imperial all those uh, problematic terms are kind of invested in, in the iconography. And very much these people on the ground who are in the midst of dismantling this piece are looking up um, at these image, uh, these uh, representations of uh, history figures, historic figures. So going back to Lauren's point, which I thought was really interesting about bringing it to our present time, what are some of the needs of our, our audience, the communities, the locations in which these are, um, are found, are situated, what is making these even more problematic today um, in this particular climate, in this particular moment? What, what are some of the ideas behind this that, that trigger? How, how can we reconstitute them or recontextualize them to to um, show how the past has re-envisioned um, where we are today. How we go when uh, during the uh, protests in the Black Lives Matter movement, there's a um, a statement, a chant that people say. It's um, uh, whose streets, our streets, and. I think what we're asking now is whose history, our history. And, and this needs to be taken into account when we're looking um, and thinking about what will replace historic monuments today um, and what will new monuments, if we even want to consider um, uh, commissioning new monuments, what that will mean for municipalities, for civic space, um, and for the artists who are commissioned. Will they be temporary? Will they be permanent? Um, will the materials have the aura around them of, of bronze and marble, or will they be made in different temporal materials? 
I also think about this idea of space, right? And gathering space and a community space. And so often, sometimes these monuments are in parks or in places where people are meant to gather and be together. How do you bring that into the conversation as well and think about very specific, your communities and people who are using space and getting to a point where obviously, you know, I don't necessarily know if consensus is a thing and that will actually could really happen, but how do you at least bring people along in this process to talk about some of those questions appropriately? Like, do we even need it? What do we want this to be? Is this a rotating series? How do we envision this? What else could this space be used for? And where else, I guess, also could these stories be told? Because I think that's the important part, right? Like, if there's important stories we're trying to convey or people we want to have as part of the ongoing conversation, are there other ways of doing this and mm -hmm. bringing it and talking about it and having it and giving it space? I think that's really an important and interesting point, Lauren. What role do these monuments play in our communities, in our society? We run into them, we, they're in public spaces, they're meant for open consumption and for frequent and regular uh, viewing. Um, what role have they played and what role should they play now? Well, the, the, I just, are we the same? Is it the same? Do we need the same things that people needed at that point? Yeah, the, 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 I mean, these statues interpolate viewers of all stripes. So it doesn't matter what skin color you are, what sexual orientation, they, they interpolate everybody and, and everyone's gaze is converged onto the statue. And, uh, and, but the message back is of course, highly contingent on the subject position of the viewer. So to someone of color, it's a different, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a different, it's the same message, but it's applied differently. Right, it's about uh, white hegemony, uh, white male hegemony, and um, and and of course everyone being different would be uh, means that the uh, the 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 re re subject so target viewers really the the white even male uh, figure um, is is the ideal viewer for these, and everyone else is supposed to agree with with that. So it's so it is a symbol of a kind of a hegemonic oppressive. Uh, symbolism, which is being being applied uniformly across the social environment. Now, those are really important points. So, Ken, would you say that there is a shift now away from that hegemonic white male view and that to a focus more on um, less on individuals, but more on and less on exemplary hero, exemplary heroic moments, but um, perhaps, and I'm throwing this out as a question on instances of injustice where memory is, is trying to be reclaimed and that's for everybody. Um, I think there's, um, I think there's, I wouldn't say there's a shift, but there is certainly a recognition of all kinds of fissures in society, which has raised the consciousness of a lot of people, particularly younger people, I must say. And, and um, because so many things have become so intolerable, not just in terms of the recognition of the uh, oppression of of uh, of the other, but also what's not working for them themselves, right? In that in that uh, uh, role in society, and so for for a lot of people, it, 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 there's a real questioning in terms of these foundational tenets of the republic, which was always based, as Brooke said earlier, on all kinds of myth uh, premised on widespread uh, hegemony. Um, Lauren, I think we talked a little bit about Bentonville, Arkansas, and the Crystal Bridges Museum, um, and how what an important place it's become over time. It's pretty recent, it's pretty new. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the work you've done and monuments that are shown in around <laughs> that part of the U.S. and the significance that yeah. the context of location has on all of this? Yeah, it's funny. It's also very interesting for this um, particular image to come up. My family currently lives in Georgia. And when we first moved there, we lived in Stone Mountain in, in this area. So thinking about something like this Confederate carving on Stone Mountain that, as you see in this image, people gathered, right? And this became a space where people, you know, come to have picnics, watch movies, there's music, and it almost falls into this background that I think probably if you ask people who are there gathered, 
they don't actually pay attention really anymore, right, to what it is. And I think that becomes this place where there's almost this danger point because we get so used to seeing this imagery and accepting it and just taking it in the background that we're not asking these questions anymore about, well, what's now and what's next? And I think, you know, growing up in the South and now living in the South, there are a lot of these monuments, memorials, the Confederate flag, very present. Um, so it's very, I appreciate the continued work that many people in our communities do and artists are doing to actually um, ask people to pay a bit more attention to actually what is in the background, right? And I think that's also the work of some museums and institutions, whereas if you maybe don't necessarily have control over the monuments that are in your town or where you are, what is the work that you can do to call attention to some of the stories that are being told? Or what are other artworks you can put in the same context to actually try to push some of these conversations and these um, questions? And I think that's, I think that's a, a good point, um, Laura, because so often historic monument almost becomes furniture in a public site and people mm -hmm. walk by it and don't pay attention to it. And what is extraordinary right now is that in this moment when we are so attuned to the flat screen that we look at all the time, that there are three dimensional objects in public space that can incite and have been inciting rage. Um, and that to me is something that should that, that we should all note and that's that's absolutely significant for this period we should also just give a, a sense of scale i've never seen stone mountain um, of the scale of the enormity of this piece um, which is carved 42 feet deep and it, the, the bottom of the work rises 400 feet from the ground. It's in a, obviously a, a granite mountain um, with the three Confederate figures. And there's an article in Smithsonian Magazine about this work that talks about how a human could stand in one of the horse's mouths. It's that mm -hmm. enormous. Um, this is by Borglum, who was the sculptor of Mount Rushmore, and he himself has a uh, very a terrible um, allegiance with the Ku Klux Klan, um, with white supremacist organizations. So, and as you remember, um, over July 4th weekend, the president used Mount Rushmore as a background. So this is all part of confirmation. Um, and continuing interest in confirming um, certain certain history. I, I was going to make a similar point about uh, Borglin um, and uh, Mount Rushmore. He was also the sculptor of the Wars of America, which is in um, um, Newark, uh, downtown Newark, New Jersey. And um, I think what's what, what's more interesting to me, is, and of course he was highly sympathetic to the KKK, but I think what's more interesting to me is the, and, and, and it's a very important point, is the is the fraught ambiguity of these of so many figures, right? In terms of the question of of the Civil War and its legacy, and in terms of attitudes towards African Americans in particular, and and it's very important to to make to remember that you know the that the uh, there's a lot of sympathizers in the North for for the plantation economy for the kind of, for the pro for the pro slavery. Uh, South and so on. So there was a lot of and that ambigu ambiguity, ambivalence in terms of race has has gone on way too long in this society. I think that's a good segue to talk about some of the alternatives or some of these uh, new ways to recontextualize or reimagine what monuments can be. Just one thing before we leave this, I love the story, Lauren, that as a child you watch movies on this space. I, I personally did not. I just, I moved there a little older when I was in college, but I know it is a gathering spot where things like what we're seeing happen. So I do like the idea that these um, uh, monuments or these outdoor spaces are social spaces. They're places to gather um, and reflect um, as well as honoring um, a certain point in history. 
but maybe we can move to the next slide and see some other images of more recent works. Oh, sorry. Um, does anybody want to quickly talk about the very famous situation at the Natural History Museum and um, some of the ideas that we've been working around in the, the movement of history away from the usual uh, heroic figure on a horse and why that's become problematic? I'm sure lots of people have seen this particular but work. It's, it's so, I think it's ironic because this is this iconography is totally unnatural to history. Do you mean in the proportions or in terms of the kind of um, uh, the kind of supremacy of the white male figure and towering above um, you know figures of difference? I found this whole issue interesting because it had been looked at by the New York Cultural Commission in 2017 and they decided to let it go that it was okay at that point. And then the Natural History Museum and I think Theodore Roosevelt's grandson himself took it upon themselves to remove it and to, and to I, we don't know where it's going to be, if it's going to have a place inside the museum, but they are re -talk, re redoing the history of the museum with Theodore Roosevelt's sponsorship inside the halls, naming uh, certain galleries after him. Um, so I, I thought that was an interesting way that one important institution has handled it in the very recent um, past. Um, but let's look at the next slide and move on to other important. So this is in Long Island City. Um, I have to say I haven't seen it yet. Um, it's very recent. Can somebody tell uh, this? This just opened at Socrates uh, Sculpture Park, as you said, Helen. Uh, work by Jeffrey Gibson. Um, the work is made of plywood and uh, poster board, and the uh, colorful surface is um, wheat paste adhered posters. So um, this is interesting that that it is that the materials are impermanent. Uh, after Socrates, it's going to travel to the de Cordova Museum um, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, Jeffrey Gibson is an indigenous American um, and often uses um, ancient history of indigenous peoples as his, as his subject matter. And it's quite striking. And you can see the proportions is all, are also quite um, monumental, but um, it has a different feel. Yeah, it, it must relate to mounds and so on along either side of the Mississippi River too. Right. Are the colors um, indicative or the shapes indicative of iconography? Yeah, the, the mounds like in Illinois and Missouri and so on. Like St. Louis itself, I mean there should be a, a monument to that. St. Louis itself, the city of St. Louis, raised several burial mounds in order to build the city, for example. And he's referring here to pre-Columbian ziggurat, that form, um, and also to, um, I believe that Jeffrey Gibson worked at the Field Museum of Natural History when he was studying at the Art Institute of Chicago um, and, um, and paid great attention to the um, 13th century um, architectural forms um, in what is now Illinois. There's an extensive discussion of the piece on the Socrates website. Yeah. Um, can we see another one? I'm sorry, Brooke, I'm going to have to ask you about this particular image we're seeing or this comparison of images we're seeing. Um, this is Martin Purrier's Big Bling on the right, which we commissioned in Madison Square, for Madison Square Park in 2016. And then the work um, traveled through the Association of Public Art in Philadelphia. And now it's on view um, for as long as it can be um, at Mass Mocha in, in North Adams. Um, I just, I think the pairing here um, demonstrates the complexities and the contradictions of the Statue of Liberty and her torch, which is ostensibly beckoning to all. Um, but Martin 
put a shackle at the apex of his work. And a shackle is a device that is used to constrain enslaved people and animals. Um, and he used, um, uh, he gilded that shackle form, which is 12 feet high. Um, he, he gilded that to make it stand out. That's the bling in the work. Um, but also to, to uh, demonstrate an inherent contradiction in the form of the shackle um, at, the, at the apex of this piece. And that image of the, um, on the left is very indicative of a lot of historical paintings of victory and uh, um, freedom um, and democracy. So I think that's a very important uh, juxtaposition. And we also had, um, we, we had Martin Fourier on and it was really touching and very moving to hear him speak about this particular work and its life, its continuing life. And I think it's important to talk about um, how some of these newer monuments or works of art or public works of art are subtler, but can be ultimately more powerful in many ways than the more traditional look at a figure, a historical figure on a white horse. Is that something that we can talk about when we look at the next image? Can I'd like to, to pose a question to Brooke, in fact, because you, are, you were uh, crucial in, in, in literally commissioned uh, Martin to create this extraordinary work. And, so I'm so glad it's now at Mass but my, my, I'd like to return to the question of the agency, because wh whether we're looking at the commissioning of these works, ordering them, or in many cases, dismantling them, re repositioning them somewhere else, this, having them disappear. Like it took an executive order of de Blasio, for instance, to remove the, the sculpture that we saw earlier on of uh, this Dr. Sims of uh, pro-Confederacy. So whether one way with that, that's right, thank you so much. Uh, you see this by order of Mayor, Mayor de Blasio, this place was, this piece was relocated uh, exactly where we, we don't know, but it's when well, my point is, we the public are often not uh, taken into account. Don't uh, any of us has ever had a voice in uh, choosing or in participating, in having a conversation about what piece goes where. And my question would be, maybe to all um, uh, members of the, of the rail, to, to our founder, to Funk, can we imagine a situation as we might have ha perhaps in most democratic country where there is a minister of culture and to have to open a public arena, a public discussion uh, about what would come to fill those gaps? Several of you have already raised that question, but the question is who will be the next person, the next agent? And what, what about us, the public, having a, a broad conversation about this? How would that sound? What would that be like? I think we're going to possibly get to that when we look at the next few images and maybe Ken to talk about the Monument Lab. I love the name lab, um, this area of experimentation and um, possible trying out of various options without one singular solution. Well, Monument Lab was begun in 2012 uh, jointly with uh, Paul Farber. We were both teaching classes on uh, public memory and uh, especially as it's uh, projected through the um, uh, statuary markers, naming of uh, important buildings and so on. And, uh, and then we started looking at um, the, um, uh, the uh, lack of equilibrium or lack of uh, the hierarchy, you might say, uneven hierarchy in terms of who's remembered, who's, who's, uh, who's heard, who's not heard, and, and who deserves to be remember, remembered but is not remembered. And so we studied, first of all, Philadelphia's uh, background. Philadelphia has over 1,500 statues, for example, and only two full-figure historical figures of, of women, right? The, I mean, there's a, probably a couple hundred full-figure women, they're all muses or angels, right? right? But in terms of historical uh, women, there's only two out of 1,500. And until about three years ago, there was not a single full-figured African-American figure, despite the fact that the African-American presence has been absolutely salient. In fact, they formed the soul of, of, of Philadelphia's constitution. So, it's, uh, so it was out of that that we formed uh, Monument Lab to 
probe these, this unevenness, unevenness in a more theoretical, more playful, more uh, innovative and creative um, sense. Mm -hmm. So relating to Joaquin, your question about how do we have more agency? How does the community and um, the audience at large uh, participate in what is actually put up and what we share um, our histories, how we share our histories? Uh, we see an image here of a Robert E. B. monument, but it's been completely changed. Um, does anybody want to give more background on this? I don't know that much about it, but I, I think it's quite powerful. Well, this is a statue along, um, you know, um, Monument Avenue, which has its own <laughs> interesting history, right? Too long to convey here, right? But it was a kind of construction. It's, a, it's based on a proscenium and, uh, you know, I'll let, you know, Piero della Francesca, that kind of idea of these kind of proscenium paintings and so on, and you have Stonewall Jackson and several other figures, and then it was supposed to be countervailed by, in more recent times, by a statue of um, Arthur Ashe, which is <laughs> itself, um, he, he deserves memorialization, but the statue is awful, awful, and so on. So, um, and uh, I think what's interesting here is uh, all the graffiti and so on, right? And this shows the, uh, unleashes the kind of energy and response of, of a much wider public to this, and I and I think that offers lessons in terms of first of all providing a interregnum of time for the public, for artists, for thinkers, for creative uh, types to respond to monuments that are problematic before a decision is even made for the removal. Lauren, going back to your comments about the timeliness that we there seems to be an urgency to this issue right now that may have taken um, a long time to get there, like the unraveling of the Confederate flag that we seem to be in a new place and trying to reconfigure some of this imagery. I just love the, um, the stance the 14 year old ballerinas are taking in front. They remind me of the Statue of Liberty and the historical paintings that I was trying to refer to, the David or just lots of um, historical paintings that I can think of that very powerful uh, stance as they're doing their ballerina pose at the same time. Um, so well, it's also the it's also like um, John Carlos and Tommy Tommy Smith at the '68 Mexico Olympics, right? The fist of resistance and so right. on. Right, right, right. So would you consider this a new monument, the way it is now, the way it's been recontextualized by people who actually see it every day and want to have it part of their community? Is this something that is a a new way to view an old um, image, an old um, figure, an old statue, so, sort of like watching films on Stone Mountain. Is this a new way for social gatherings to take place and a conversation to come about? I think we're seeing people reclaiming public space in new ways and also putting layer on layer of, of contemporary perspective onto historic sites. And that's what um, I mean, this the performance by the um, black ballerinas. If again, if you go online, there are many images. It's fantastic um, because it's, it's energizing a space in a completely new way and in a way of great urgency and activism. Right, and to me, it feels like it's a it's a step. Right, it, this is not necessarily I think what it will be like this will change and next, but this was sort of the community and people coming together to say, you know what, we have to take action. We are changing this. This is ever evolving for us. And right now this is what it is. And I think to me that is more interesting to even understand what these ever evolving conversations will be. And if it comes down and when it comes down and then what and how it continues and it come down, like how it just sort of continues to evolve as well. So, so I want to pick up on a word you used. You actually used the word conversation. And Ken, I think we have an image from the Monument Lab of two figures um, who are actually speaking on pedestals. Um, Mel Chin, and this is in your neck of the woods. Uh, can you tell us how this came about? And again, it seems to be you know, talking about the idea of these monuments or these 
um, public art my, um, figures as being pedestals, as being a social space, a place for gathering. Right. This is a this is a great work by uh, Mao Chun for the Monument Lab exhibition that we uh, I co, I co curated in uh, 2017, and it's premised on the idea that uh, you know the kind of singularity, the unitary um, convergence of um, into a, a single point of most statues, is now uh, even fractured into two. It's divided, right, and bifurcated, and so and each one it's called to me. It's a, obviously a play on play on words like to me, but also to me, um, T-W-O or T-O, right? And so it's ambiguous in terms of the titling, but once one person goes up to uh, onto a pedestal, they become monumentalized, so to speak. They, they stand in the place of the, of the missing statue, but then as, uh, as they uh, stand there, they see uh, to their left or to the right, another person going up and also being monumentalized. And there's a kind of, breaking up of the kind of unitary that the, there's high the, that the self is highly contingent on the presence of of others to 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 foment a community and i think that's the radicality of this work do you see these as temporary i mean lauren i think um i'm referring to something you just said about their maybe transitional or temporary um works they're not meant to be seen in the way that we see two young girls in ballerina poses with graffiti that perhaps that's not the permanence of this particular um piece but um a message or uh, uh, even um you can read a uh, history on that particular image um how do you think these are works are talking about bigger ideas around freedom and democracy and even about this concept of America that the older or the previous reiteration, the iteration of these monuments don't do, that they're more powerful in the ideological value of them. Um, and Ken, I think you spoke a little bit about the language and the iconography around them. Well, I mean, I think the Mao Chin work is is clearly about that the, the self is not some singular entity that's autonomous, right? That's what we were led to believe going back to the Enlightenment and even much earlier. Uh, but that the self is highly dependent on uh, on its constitution by its relationship to others, by its infusion with by by others, and I think that's what's what what's important to recognize. Whereas statuary is premised on the idea that the statue is autonomous, it's, it's, it's singular, it's unitary, and it's, and it's, as I said earlier, premised on the assumption of universal uh, assent and consensus in terms, of, in terms of the value it purports to embody. Can we return to that? I love what you're saying. Thanks, uh, Ken, but can we go back to the previous images? Because I think that touches precisely on uh, what uh, Helen and, and Lauren, you were just, no, no not, not this one, not this, yes, thank you. In fact, what I think, Lauren, you, you hinted at that, and I'd like to to um, hear how all three of you uh, see, if you think about that. What what is happening, to use Ken's words right now, is that uh, the public is actually intervening, is rewriting the history of these monuments. You know, is counterwriting it. You, know, you might say it reminds me a little bit historically of what happened in in Germany in 1989 when the wall broke down. And at some point, there was a, some intervention. I mean, the walls first became like the, what you're seeing here, the, the support for a burst, an explosion of, of freedom, of all kinds of, exp of expressions that could never take place during communist uh, East German uh, government. And then suddenly it was about to go away. And so the government decided, well, let's wait. Let's take some, let's retain the marks of this explosion of freedom and turn it itself into some kind of a monument. And I'm just wondering whether we might not think of a, of a situation whereby we could actually give these bursts of expression some kind of monumentalization, a new vision of the monuments where they become the support for these expressions of, uh, of muted voices for, for over a century. Well, I think there's some powerful examples that perhaps Brooke, you can give us some background about um, that represent or show a change in the role of the artist in all of this and how the artist interpretation of, of these ideas um, have become to the fore, have become more important. Um, do we have an, I think we can go to the Arlene Sheckett or um, I can't remember what 
even the mark point is interesting that uh, this was part of our lean check it's project in 2018 called full steam ahead and she directly engaged with a wood figure um, a wood female figure placing this woman at the feet of Admiral Farragut, who was a um, Union um, uh, figure in the, in the Civil War. And Arlene's work is a modernist, it really recalls Ellie Nadelman's um, forms of his, his figures, but it is taking, uh, it's, it's humorous, but it's also pretty nervy uh, to place a temporary female in a uh, quite a strong pose um, in front of the admiral who's in who's in bronze. Um, and well, I just want to add that um, going back, to, uh, connecting what Brooke just said to what Joachim just said a, a moment ago. These things um, is premised on the kind of uh, a, a, a production of a kind of aura of hallowed space around the statue, and when the public intervenes, or artist intervenes and and, and, and puts in and um, their markings and sculptures or whatever, then that that the sanctity of that space gets that's opened up and challenged. But it but it's actually uh, something positive because you're producing space. You're actually producing a true public space for for, for new imaginings of of how public space could exist in the future. I just okay. I was gonna say I just to echo what Ken is saying. I think that is what is more interesting. Right, I think that's where it gets at what it feels like we should be thinking about now versus, well, who, who gets monuments? What are they monuments of? But what is the use of this public space? And what are these conversations? And how can we have that dialogue sort of to what Ken is speaking to? I think that is where the most, to me, interesting part of the conversation and where there's so much potential. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I want to mention also that, interestingly, we know who is the figure on the pedestal, Admiral Farragut. The female carvings um, on the historic monument here are um, uh, metaphorical. They're called loyalty and courage. They're not named. Um, again, demonstrating this sense of heroism um, of, an, of, a, of a male um, war figure. So just to get to the back to the question of this conversation, we're supposed to be answering the question, are monuments still necessary? Um, are, do we still need monuments um, in the society or in our communities today? And um, maybe we can just address that by saying we've, we're, during this past hour, we've been looking, we had the benefit of hindsight and, and looking at history to examine some of these uh, images. They're not actually in the flesh right now, but in, in imagining how they played a role um, as public art. So thinking in the net for the next generation or in the next 50 years, I think that's sort of the 50 to 100 years is what we've been covering um, so far. What are some of the ideas or viewpoints or what are some of the discussions you hope will take place when people are looking at the monuments of today? Well, I, I think uh, there, will, there will always be a need for monuments. I mean, you know, I can't imagine a scenario where the, some um, huge event doesn't happen where people don't want to remember it, a sizable number of people. I think that's not the issue. The issue is more um, new ways of imagining or uh, defining monuments, because the monuments t at present is, is really uh, defined by a very closed discursive system. It's very, very tight. And, um, and, and I think it's incumbent on us to open that up, right? Mm -hmm. To be much more inclusive. So it's not the question of whether monuments will endure, but the question of how we think about the, uh, the term monument and, mm -hmm. and how they should operate in a much more open sense. And would you like to try to take a stab at that in our last few minutes of this conversation of what role should monuments play in, in this, in, for us right now? Well, I mean, monuments, uh, well, that's the whole premise of uh, Monument Lab is to try to create uh, new spaces for imaginings of, of, of future monuments, right? And future monuments could include something that's highly temporal, 
or provisional, for example, right? Which yeah. counter is runs counter to the way monuments are uh, are are supposed to perform nowadays. Right. So that's what I mean by opening up the strictures of, of how we think about uh, monuments um, and and see what happens. Broadening okay. perspective and trying new things. Yes. I'd like to throw in a, an example and hear what you what you three have to to say about it. I know we it was mentioned before, but uh, I, I'm thinking about um, to me an extremely successful way to think about monuments with uh, taking into account Lawrence's uh, point about plurality, multiple conversations, and this notion of dialogues, and that is absolutely central to what we are today. And I'm talking about Maya Lin's um, uh, memorial to to the Vietnam War in Washington a work of genius, I will say, uh, for, my, for myself. But this is a way to rethink completely the language of monumentality. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you for putting it up. How do you, how do you guys feel about this? Well, it's, I mean, it's a great uh, paradigm shifting work, but it's also, why is it paradigm shifting? It's actually quite classical, the language. I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it's a very embodying experience. So I think monuments should, should have a kind of embodying aspect and I think it should also interpolate viewers differently in terms of the way they um, are called forth by by it. So in this case, the calling forth of the viewer in, in terms of their relationship to a particular time marked by the Vietnam War and its legacy. And plus the fact that it obviously upsets the uh, more vertical um, construction of, of monuments in favor of something that's even subterranean, not even just uh, horizontal, but subterranean. I think there's kind of a, a remarkably beautiful work. You have to remember too that a memorial stands for remembrance um, and it marks a time. A monument, the, the traditional goal of a monument was to solidify a reputation for and to start that reputation ongoing into history. So I think that there are two, there are different aims for, um, for these two public forms. Maya's work was extraordinarily groundbreaking um, and it changed the language of memorials for the future. But the I think, it, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. sorry. No, I think you, I, I see exactly what you're saying, and I agree, with, but I think at the intersection of the two is the crucial nexus of memory, of how one deals with memory, how one perpetuates memory. both, both uh, uh, genres different in their own differences have that same goal. And, and, and I think as we're thinking about reshaping entirely the world, the, the, the language of monumentality, perhaps looking back at something as groundbreaking, as you said, as Mayas could be a, one of the multiple possibilities. I think this is a great work to talk about what all our panelists have uh, spoken about in terms of dialogue and conversation. To have both of these figures, um, the memorial by Maya Lin and this Frederick Hart statue side by side. Um, if you remember, there was a lot of critical um, uh, blowback about Maya Lin's work. And so that this Frederick Hart plays a little bit of a counterweight to some of the voices that were um, heard uh, against Maya Lin's work, who was quite young um, and unknown at the time. Um, I know that we have lots of questions and I wanted to make sure that people in the audience had a chance to ask questions because I know that this is a topic that many people have been thinking about and having conversations over their dinner table and just with friends and walking in the park um, as we're outdoors much more now. Um, so perhaps we can open up the forum to everyone out there, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Nick, are we ready for uh, questions? Hi, sorry, sorry for that delay. I just switched to that button. Uh, well, first of all, yes, it's a great moment to switch to many of the questions we have, um, but I first wanna thank all of you uh, Lauren, Brooke, Ken, Helen, and Joaquim for rising to the challenge of talking about something so complex within one hour. Um, so as we kick off the questions, uh, first, I'm going to pass the mic off to Marsha. 
Uh, Marsha, I'm going to activate your mic now. Marsha, can you hear us? Just a moment, everyone, while the audio connects. Uh, ah, Marsha, are you there? Unable to, I'm unable to. Okay, so sorry, everyone. Um, I'm going to read Marsha's question on her behalf, if you don't mind. Um, and maybe in the background, we can try to get her mic uh, situated. So Marsha wrote, perhaps in light of the cancellation of Lava Thomas's Maya Angelou monument by the city of San Francisco, the speakers can address the challenges to the creation of new monuments and the elusiveness of quote unquote consensus. So maybe we'll pass that off uh, to maybe to you first, Brooke. Um, hi, Marsha and everyone. Uh, I think that in a hundred years from now, just as we're looking back on monuments from a century ago, um, fast forward into the future, people are going to look at this time as a transformational period when the public had an impact um, on the conversations of what was um, designated for public space. And, um, Committees now through the uh, Department of Cultural Affairs, at least in New York City, are bringing the public in to hearings. Um, and that seems for permanent monuments in civic space, this is what uh, a, a, a significant change um, is. Does anyone else want to try and Take a stab at that before we move on. Well, I think there should be, um, you know, I'm thinking about the J. Marion Sims and the debacle that uh, uh, went about that one, um, um, right, in terms of the uh, pub members of the public who were invited as uh, to at least uh, be uh, in on the conversation about what should, what should go in its place and uh, then feeling that uh, even though they uh, put their input in and it, they understood initially that uh, the, the a, a jury of, experti uh, of experts were going to uh, make the decision. At some point, the rules changed because the public was in on it. And so, you know, you can't kind of like just go by the original rules anymore. So I think you, there needs to be uh, transparency um, to the utmost degree in terms of um, the, uh, you know, uh, public input, if there's public input. I think my microphone might be on now. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Um, I, I agree with very strongly with Ken's addition to the conversation about this because the question of temporary and ephemeral monuments I find particularly intriguing, particularly in light of what's happening at Socrates. Uh, this is something I talked about with Zaveria Simmons in the rail interview that I did, and it's certainly something that Jeffrey Gibson was considering. So the idea of saying history will decide or a commission will decide on permanent monuments seems to just put us all back in front of the same mirror, whereas what happened in San Francisco recently was um, almost like the equivalent of um, censorship by prior restraint. Uh, there were some objections to the, um, the monument that had been proposed and the work was just never realized. I mean, even though it was in final stages. So I'm interested in this play between accepting the ephemeral the idea of keeping what may have been intended as ephemeral, such as uh, graffiti on a monument, and simply saying, well, history will decide or a commission will decide. Um, it seems as though we could make decisions that 
in which we acknowledge that they're not permanent, but they're decisive for the moment. So this is what I was intrigued by. I think there are a lot of issues around permanence and impermanence and community um, participation in deciding whether they be commissions or um, just spontaneous community action. Um, I know we were just talking about the United States and what's been happening locally within our communities and not far uh, and not reaching too far internationally, but one of the images that we were able to show was the Mark Quinn work that was put up in Bristol after a historic mon monument was taken down. Maybe one of our panelists can give more detail, but um, when the com when this community had chosen the Mark Quinn work, it was literally taken down 24 hours afterwards um, because it wasn't um, properly it wasn't a discussion around the new work being put up in a proper manner. So um, there are lots of issues that we could have spoken about, about this idea of impermanence. Well, I, can I just add one point about permanence? Permanence is also something which is also constructive because a statue is only permanent because there's a lot of money and um, uh, being paid to maintain the statue to look permanent. Right? So a statue is always changing, it's always degrading, it's, you know, the copper is coming through if it's bronze, and so on, all right, the wheat poles get bigger over time because of the rain, and so on. So, you know, to, to that itself is also a kind of il illusion that the idea of a statue is permanent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and to, to Marsha's point, I would like to say that, you know, the history with a big H is a non-entity, it's an abstraction, a void abstraction. And, we are making history. The history is being made at this instant by the, 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 the plurality of us. The monument, in essence, being a very monolithic, monophonic, uh, it only carries one voice, one pair of eyes, and it's very much about an individual. It sort of negates, almost by essence, the, the polyphony of, this, uh, of these historical forces, which now have been reclaimed by such movements as Black Lives Matter, but not only. It's really something that is generating a considerable energy all, all around the globe. And so my, my question almost to all of us, and again, going back to, to Fong, to Helen, who's a member of the, the trustees of the, the rail, uh, we continue this debate beside, beyond uh, this, uh, this great program. I, I think it would be really interesting to try to orchestrate plurality of options from uh, any number of us uh, moving forward. Nick, are there more questions or um, can we yes. ask one? Uh, of course. Um, we have a question from uh, rail editor at large, Jason Rosenfeld. Uh, Jason, I am going to pass the mic off to you. Thanks very Jason, much. I just want to say I've been watching your comments and they're all fabulous. I wish we <laughs> could address them in real time. It's okay, but thank you, Brooke, for hosting this. It's been terrific, and all the participants. I wanted to follow up on the issue about Mark Quinn and his sculpture um, that he made for Bristol of the um, protester Jen Reed, and that replaced the sculpture of the slave trader Edward Colston, and which engendered, as you said, a lot of controversy and was taken down within 24 hours. Um, one artist, Thomas J. Price, who's a black artist, uh, in Britain, a sculptor um, who just had a work actually installed in Stratford called uh, The Black Every Woman, he calls it. He's a realist sculptor, um, really objected to it, um, partly because it was seen as an act of self-aggrandizement, you know, on the part of Quinn, uh, but also because uh, it was the continuation of the idea of uh, a white artist dealing with a subject which in our realm of present identity politics and activity uh, was something which it was felt that it was better suited to an, a black artist to react to that removal of the sculpture in Bristol. And it made me think of uh, one of Malcolm Gladwell's great podcasts in Revisionist History, season two, episode four, which is about a monument in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, a sculpture by Ronald S. McDowell where he rethought a civil, civil rights period photograph of a white police officer and an attack dog and a young black protester. 
um, and changed it in a great way. Uh, and Gladwell has a good line where he says, you know, this is what happen, happens when people who have not had a voice finally have the opportunity to make art. Um, so maybe the panel can respond to these kinds of things and the idea of identity and, and you know, who is licensed to make the new monuments and should that be a question? Should that be an issue? No, that's, this is a great, uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Jason. Nick, could we perhaps have a, an image of this, uh, Mark Quintins, uh, we spent a few yeah. minutes discussing it, it would be I great. also see comments about the Fort Flint in Trafalgar Square in London too, and maybe that can be put in the chat mm. box as a response to. Great idea. Oh, thank you, thank you, yes. So, so here you see this uh, sculpture of uh, Jane Reed, if you look at it uh, from its vocabulary, simply it looks, it is done, and this is very much what Mark Wayne does according to the classical tropes of uh, um, monumental sculpture that we've seen so many examples of, except that this is a, 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 a protester and a major member of the Black Lives Matter. Um, and it did create a controversy. This is not the first time Queen does that. Um, but maybe we could comment on the contradictions uh, taken on by Quinn using this kind of classical vocabulary. If you don't pay attention to the subject matter, it's a sculpture like any other sculpture, but the content is a complete uh, contradiction, opposition to, 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 to the vocabulary. Well, I mean, this classical vocabulary uh, is, you know, is also not classical in the sense that it's all computer generated now. Right, whereas uh, you know the classical vocabulary was also the process of the hand, you know, molding the clay and then making the pla plaster and then, then then making a mold and then pouring the bronze. So it, it's just become one more uh, you know um, tool in terms of the art of of contemporary artists. But I do think the uh, the question was: Is it important the the optics of identity? And I think it's absolutely important, especially at this time. Maybe uh, you'll mitigate to a degree in the future if, uh, if things are uh, re addressed and redressed in terms of social inequity and so on. But at this moment, uh, the optics, I have to say, doesn't look that good you know, for Mark Quinn to be able to um, exercise what's obviously expensive to make and then to, um, with some celerity, just kind of install it, right? And I'm not knocking him as an artist, I'm just saying optically, I, I think it, it, it's, it has its issues. Yeah, and I think overall, like even separating it from this one particular sculpture, but this idea of, yes, why would we not <laughs> diversify and open up the body of who is the people who are making these sculptures, right, and getting these commissions and getting the money and getting the recognition. I think it even speaks to almost another, I would, I would even say maybe that is absolutely what we should be doing across the board when it comes to thinking about if we are saying, okay, these monuments are coming down and if the decision is made by particular communities to replace them with other monuments, though I think, as we've said, there are other ways of thinking about that and what we want to go about. Why not make a commitment to saying, you know what, whoever is creating this is actually going to be someone who would not have been able to do this before, right? And been left out of the conversation. That just feels like almost the very least that we could do. Remember too that it was, it was citizens who took down the Colston work and threw it in the harbor um, in Bristol. So that is a moment, an opportunity to engage those individuals um, to talk about what is next on this empty platform. Yeah, thank you very much. Great talk today, really, really incisive. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Jason, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your answers. Uh, next, I would like to pass the mic off to uh, Kimberly, our, our poet today. Um, Kimberly, I believe you should be able to speak now. I do have a question, but I actually feel like Ken addressed it. So okay. would it be OK if I pass? Sure. Okay. Uh, then I would like to next go to uh, Deanna. Deanna, I am going to pass the mic off to you to ask your question. 
Can you hear us, Jana? Bear with us, everyone. Sorry, just to. Okay, hi. Am I here? Hi. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> yes, sorry, I had to change um, headphones. Um, thanks, Nick uh, and the Rail again for an, a really stimulating conversation. Um, thank you to all the members of the panel. Um, I just have some random thoughts um, running through my head. So, uh, one thing is that occurs to me is that the um, the nature of figurative representation is it plays a key role in in any controversy regarding public works whether they're monuments or memorials. Um, and that I think it's really interesting that these um, more recent works like Martin, um, those by Martin Perrier and, and also the Maya Lin uh, Vietnam Memorial, um, these abstract pieces actually can achieve a, a, almost a better purpose in some ways. Um, and then also I was thinking about how how do people think the ostensibly secular memorials and monuments compare to images of religious figures that have been you know established for many many centuries um and that i was thinking about the image of the stone mountain memorial um and that facade of stone um really reminded me of the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban. Mm. And that it raises this question of like, what is considered sacred or worth keeping? Who is making the changes? Um, you know, like who, who makes the culture and what, and what specifically what culture and when and who changes it, et cetera. So th there's just these sort of wild issues that are running through my head. And I really appreciate you all stimulating them for me. So, <laughs> so please, um, just say whatever you think. <laughs> well, well, the, the Banyan uh, Buddhist uh, sculptures aren't just uh, monuments because they're, they were big, but uh, you know, monuments can also be uh, like uh, Rigaud said, uh, wrote about, Aloise Rigaud wrote, it can be also unintentional. Nietzsche also wrote about it, that over time, uh, something be can become important and they accrue the status of monumentality. So even, even if originally there's no intention in the modern sense of bestowing designations of monumentality on them. And so whereas the Stone Mountain one is not, doesn't have that duration of time. It was a, it was a kind of premise on a false, false uh, you know, lost cause uh, remembrance, which has no basis in history and it's not particularly old. So the intention is totally different. Mm -hmm. You know, monuments are storytelling, and they become storytelling in a public uh, sphere. And I think what a consensus here would be is that we should be looking to artists um, to consider what is the new monument and how to uh, bring those into new spaces for people. If, if we heed the artist, um, I think we'll find many solutions there. Thank you, Brooke. I just wanted to add one thing. I just what Brooke. I just wanted to refer to what Brooke said about monuments being a part of a story or telling a story. And I'm thinking about monuments to prepare for this talk and trying to figure out how to get all of these really interesting topics in a very short period of time. Um, we may have to do another episode of this one. It's another session for this one. But um, I, it really makes me think about the importance of these stories and the myths, the myth making that we do as a society. And um, I think Joachim and everybody was talking about the, sh the changes or the way history is not permanent. And there is a lot of um, uh, change, uh, shifts or changes that take place around it. But throughout, I feel as if these uh, important uh, monuments that sometimes don't last the test of time or have a, re, um, a different story to tell than it had originally fill a place in our soul and our minds about who we are and they play a role um, in which myths did in earlier 
versions of history um, throughout time. So I'm just uh, very mindful about how these uh, important monuments that we either give them this importance or they uh, take it upon themselves by the greatness of what they're trying to, the ideas that they're trying to put forward um, to all of us. So I'd like to echo again, uh, Lawrence, uh, one of Lawrence's last remarks, which I thought was so um, rich and and, and Lauren, your institution, uh, Crystal Bridges, again, was responsible curatorially for putting together an exhibition a few years ago. Uh, you, you, you will tell me what year, called The State of the Art. And the, the premises of this exhibition was completely incredible. The curators went ar around America and looked at artists who had never been given a show. The, the, the criteria were negative. Artists who basically were never given the voice uh, as major participants in the um, in the art world, and this uh, this exhibition remains so um, vibrant in my mind. And it's it's one could imagine something like this going to a, any number. I and mean, of course, it would be quite an, quite a task, right? Uh, of those people who, had, as you said, never were given uh, a voice, Lauren. Yeah, well, it's and we actually um, if you come to Bentonville now, you can see State of the Art 2020. Um, part of it is still oh. up, so it's an ongoing. <laughs> exhibition but I think it's for me and one of the things that you know I think with the first state of the art and then the exhibition that I was able to co-curate with Allison Glenn and Alejo Benedetti um, was really this idea of who's who's known right and whose perspective so it's not so much about this idea of discovery because I think that's extremely fraught and complicated but this idea of you know we asked our colleagues working all across the country who are the artists in your area that you think deserve a second look or who would you, whose voice would you elevate? And so we would do these visits and have these conversations. And I think inevitably what I enjoy about the idea of state of the art and I think it's just important and even thinking about this idea of who gets to create these new monuments or memorials or however we're thinking about them. How do we make sure that we are bringing in different voices and not just asking the same people and not just asking the people who maybe would have the privilege um, or the connection or one of the comments in the chat, the idea that someone can just very quickly make a sculpture and put it up, right? There's already a sense of privilege in that. So whose mm -hmm. voices are being left out or overlooked or how can we just make sure that the conversation is a wide ranging group of people that are specific to communities and specific to artists and just really as wide as possible, obviously knowing that's not always it's brought with its own complications, but it just seems like the work that we should try to do. Yeah, uh, Lauren, I don't know if you're seeing on the screen the numbers of uh, numbers of thumbs up as you as you keep speaking, describing this this moment. I, I wasn't absolutely not aware that there is a, another version and that you co curated it. This is. Yeah, I'll send you a catalog, Joachim. I'll send you a catalog. Thank, thank you. Would love that. Thanks thank a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I am going to pass the the mic off next to Julian. Julian, you should be able to ask your question now. Hi, thank you so much for this fantastic conversation. Just a, a couple of uh, quick thoughts and, and a question. Uh, I'm an architect and a professor of architecture. I've been involved working on projects dealing with memory, public space, you know, for quite some time. Uh, with artist Christophe Wodichko, we designed the memorial to the abolition of slavery in Nantes in France, that you can see, and has to do with many of the things that you have been all discussing which has to do with visibility, has to do with ethics, has to do with how do we address the question of public space. And I would like to sort of frame this, this question by, by suggesting, you know, in terms of what comes next, that part of the, the, this new monument or new monumentality may go back to the idea of the word itself, which has to do with remind, to warn, and to advise. Uh, but also to understand that we're talking about democratic public space. And we have seen in our democratic public spaces that you know, somehow can be measured the capacity sort of, or to encourage processes of disrupting the continuity of history of victors. You know, we have seen this. And I think as cultural agents, as artists, as architects, curators, you know, I think we want to deepen the significance of the public domain. So we have to create works and public programs that render new kinds of visibilities in our, in our, in our cities. So the question, that I'd like to sort of uh, propose or to ask is, is kind of a twofold. One is the notion of shedding light over difficult memories, past and present injustices, collective traumas, 
while inviting publics, different kinds of publics, to engage with transformative healing and reconstructive work. How do you see that? That we one part. And the second one is that we have to understand that whenever we do a project, you know, as curators, commissioners, architects, designers, artists, we take risks. You know, we have to continue to take risks because it's important that memory does not stay immersed inside, but is affirmed in the public domain, in the public sphere. So I'd like if you could comment on the notion of healing reconstructive work, but also the affirmation and the risk taking that we need to, to have all of us. I want to thank for the time and for the, the wonderful conversation. I would love to be in contact with many of you later. I think your comments are, are spot on. Uh, in framing your question with relation to Christophe Wodichko is very significant because that is an artist, Christophe is an artist who for a half century has been giving voice uh, to people who may not have, who typically have not uh, been up on the pedestal, uh, to people experiencing homelessness, to victims of violence, uh, to resettled refugees. And those are uh, significant works. And what that, what Christoph does is in a sense, he infiltrates public space and takes risk, as you say, through bringing uh, new voices to these older, historic, perhaps tired monuments. But in, in doing so, he is transforming um, uh, what we know of what a, what a monument can be. So, so what, we, what we've done together is many projects dealing with memory, including the Memorial in Nantes, yes. uh, which is a quite large public space that de dedicated to the memory of you know, slavery, slave trade, and slave people, and, and abolition. Uh, but, but I think, Brooke, what you're saying is very important. And I think that that's, to me, the key for the future of the monuments, not, not understanding them as an object, but understanding the idea of memory you know, as an action. And, I have and, seen this, you know. and, and the conversations that an artist like Christoph yeah. raises are not comfortable, yeah. um, but perhaps you know this is this is important. Um, this is significant work that he's doing. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, so much for that question. Um, I, I do want to remark that this is absolutely a conversation that could go on for, for absolutely hours. Um, and it is uh, an important one. And I, I really want to thank all of you in the audience for asking your questions. I apologize, we don't have time to get to everyone today. But I do want to, for the last and final question, pass the mic off over to our very own Fong Bui. Uh, Fong, you should be able to Thank you, Nikki. Yes. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Brooke, uh, Joachim, Ken, and Helen, and also uh, Julian for asking that very last question. Uh, I, I, um, I remember when I, um, maybe it was 2014, I can remember when the book came out, Brian Stevenson, who's coming on our show, I hope next month, uh, the author of Just Mercy, um, story of justice and redemption. And one of the things that he brought up, um, you know, he's a death row lawyer, a legendary figure really, who created the Equal Justice uh, Initiative and the Lynching Memorial, more or less inspired by the Holocaust Monument in Berlin. And my, my feeling is that I agree with you, Brooke, when you say that monument uh, about storytelling and I would add that the storytelling of the winners, you know, has never been a loser. So I think that's important. Just remember in, in college studying Kobe, and I remember how much, how moved I was at the, the monumental painting, Barrier of Ona. It's just an ordinary member of the, the small community, not someone who uh, was monumentally important, you know, it's just an ordinary, um, member of the, uh, that small community. It, it did not romanticize the depiction of grief or mourning. And I was thinking if we were to advance in any way, because one of the things that Brian brought up 
is that people don't want to admit wrongdoing because, especially in this country, because it, 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 they expect only punishment in return. You know, that's one thing that I think that we are very good at in punishing people when they doing something wrong or wrongdoing and, and whatnot. But to me, being an immigrant, I'm very sensitive like the rest of us are, is that we, we don't see the literature. If we were to rewrite the narrative, it has to start with children because last, yesterday we, we talked about how art education has to begin with kindergarten, you know, mm -hmm. onward to maybe high school. Uh, is really, when you look at early ch uh, books on children, history for children, you don't see Native American in there. You don't see uh, African American in there. You don't see Chinese, you don't see, you know, you don't see Mexican people. You don't see Filipinos or Indian. It's not in that very beginning narrative. Right. So it's very difficult, I think, to expect people to change gear as we are hoping to do at the moment. So it's not really a question, but it's one that you just had to think about it, how to remediate the beginning to go back, I think. It can be useful. Thank you. Fong, I think that's um, incredibly important what you say. And of course, when you speak of storytelling, it's who gets to speak and who is silenced. I mean, this is exactly why narrative is so powerful. You know, it's it's very powerful. None, uh, none out school had that. You know, I don't remember watching my nieces and my nephew study uh, early American history, and I don't think we want we won't be able to end racism uh, and our children of color. Um, they don't. I don't think they will get the dignity that they deserve from what their people have done and built, built this country. I mean, that's exactly what Martin did with that beautiful moving piece for Brown University. They acknowledge it. So I think that's a very important thing. No reconciliation without actual acknowledgement. Only when somebody acknowledges, I think there's hope to recreate different kind of narrative because otherwise I think that Anglo children um, will get poisoned by white supremacy and, and white privilege. It's exactly what, what you know we are going through right now, that struggle. Yeah, I wanted just to comment on, on, on Brooke's good point because I think it's not just the knowledge. Uh, we privilege a certain type of knowledge, a certain type of uh, thinking Mm -hmm. uh, fetishize it, in fact, at the expense of all kinds of valuable, under-regarded, under-appreciated, subjugated knowledges, right? Like oral histories from uh, all kinds of indigenous peoples, deeply, deeply under-regarded as, as, as somehow not knowledge, as somehow, and so on. So I think, the, the, you know, we need to also open up this question of white mentality to the question of subjugated knowledges and, and to be open to the wisdom that's offered by uh, in a much broad, broader sense than, than we are willing to uh, accept today. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Back to you, Nikki. Uh, I want to thank all of you so much. Um, thank you, Brooke, Lauren, Ken, for your perspectives on this conversation. Thank you, Helen and Joachim, for opening the conversation up. And thank you, everyone that asked questions. Um, again, Thank you for those that asked we weren't able to get to. Um, this has indeed been a really stimulating conversation that in, absolutely needs to continue. Um, but with that, we have a tradition here at The Rail that we close every conversation with a poetry reading. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Kimberly Olivio, and I will give a very quick introduction and pass the mic off. Kimberly's most recent publications are Once Teeth, Bones, Coral from Belladonna, A Cell of Falls from Portab Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs, and Why Letter Ellipses, a forthcoming book from Selva Oscura Press this fall. Kimberly, welcome. Uh, I pass the mic over to you. Thank you. I want to particularly thank Catherine 
Ansem and everyone at the Brooklyn Rail and congratulations on new social environment for its 100 ongoing, I would say monumental series. Um, I really am honored because I really love the question of its gathering, which for me has a lot of abolitionist valences, like radical questioning of whether we want um, something that seems permanent, um, structurally, Actually. police, capitalism, monuments. So in that spirit, I'm gonna read. Um, I picked these two pieces from my Belladonna book, which was just published. And um, the first one is from a selection from a long poem called Pours Pour. Unbind here, sense, summons, ease, center, mistaken planet, bright queries, trap, mild, silent, profane prayer. Obliterate binary, estranged, life born, purple, ranging, utilitarian emojis. Usual tricks, calm, straight razor, wrist, love, objects, yes, renewal sake, train, secret, public mistake, adrenaline, edge, reckless, abandon of abandon, miasma. Super new, super new moon, libation fevers, frothing mineral muck. By night sky, pours pour, may. Luminous familiar, peels, twin likeness, bloom tenderness, cake. Verse, long limbed, encirclement hold, thigh, elbow, finger, wide berth, attention, beauty, find mouth, known landscape. Farewell occasion composes, flushed, open-mouthed, very still. Elsewhere dream unfolds, right eye, left, transmits, machine. Proprioceptive gradients, frame, animal blue, inflected. Held, touched bodies, stripped, mousing statue. Swerve gentle knife, skirt scar milk. Retina floats light. Light gravitates, ghost, left temple, leans, peripheral. This is a shorter one from a piece, a long poem called Continent Reverence. Native to you, inhabitant of you, so as to be entitled to maintenance, so as to be chargeable upon you, deserved by you, pertained to you, in the power of you, at your disposal, your concern, your proper business, resident of proper place. Seize neither fury, hatred, every vessel fill, horizon, vertigo, soft, stone touch. Devotion, obsession, crescent, cradle, ache. I swear I can rip the walls off this house. Keep bare hand. Continent, reverence, pleasure, cancer, exfluent, vain bloom, Mira, left, right, familiar colonial melancholy, ancestral ties, squeezed eyes, pleasure. Watch second hand clock, formless intimacies, wounds, silent blank lines, ellipses, whole page, empty prophecy. Don't want to write monuments. Stand, sudden say, let's pay, we're losing light. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for that reading. Uh, there are lots of clapping hands in the audience right now. Um, uh, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this happens every day at 1 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, we are thrilled to welcome poet, musician, artist, Devondra Barnhart with rail editor at large, Constance Llewellyn. So please tune in if you can. And uh, before we head off, uh, I encourage everyone to say goodbye or hello or whatever you would like to say. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves or activate your mics now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Kimberly. Thanks, Thank you, Helen. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you. Great talk today.
well, everybody. Thank, thank you, Pam. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for that great thank question, you. Jeffrey. This is a very good one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helen and Joaquin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you so much. Good week. Thank you, thank you everyone, thank you. for joining. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for the important question and comment. Thank you, Paul. And, uh, yeah, we'll get together. This is important. Paul, no, no. come in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. So good to see everyone. Thank you. That was fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Thanks, bro. Helen. Thank you, bro. Get some lunch, okay? <laughs> I love, love and, and